Welcome to the Reflective Practitioner. We've compiled this training resource to show you how the guidance developed jointly by the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges, COPMED, the General Medical Council and the Medical Schools Council can be effectively used in practice. We're going to use a clinical case and two very different interactions between a doctor and their supervisor to define reflection, show you how reflection is central to both personal learning and improving patient safety, review the what, so what and now what framework for reflection, and show you how to support an effective reflective discussion. What is reflection? Here's a useful definition from the guidance. Medicine is an apprenticeship. Every day we are immersed in rich experiences and opportunities to learn. Doctors and medical students are continuously moving around this learning cycle. After an experience, we review and describe the experience. Then we analyze and draw conclusions before we plan what to do next. The learner then enters the cycle again as they move from novice to mastery. Many of us do this independently every day and we don't necessarily need to log it or write it down. For more challenging cases, areas of good practice and at times where insight may be limited, it can be helpful to go through this process using a clear structure with or without support from another doctor. Reflection empowers medical students and doctors to show insight by identifying actions that will help us learn, improve our practice and develop greater self-awareness. It also helps identify opportunities to improve the quality of care and patient safety. Most importantly, there's a strong public interest in medical students and doctors being able to reflect in an open and honest way. Reflection is personal. There is no one way to reflect. The approach you take will be influenced by the nature and scope of your work and your personal style of learning. There are many different frameworks for reflection that support structured thinking and help to focus the quality of reflections. We recommend the what, so what, and now what framework. What? So what? Now what? We're now going to take you through the case of Mr. Jones, a 26 year old diabetic who was admitted by Dr. Stone. Read through the case and consider what happened. So what does it actually mean and now what can Dr. Stone learn from this and change in the future?
Watch this interaction with Dr. Stone and their clinical supervisor. It's at the end of an operating list in the coffee room. Think about if there's any structure to the conversation, any areas of good practice, and suggestions for improvement. Ben, thanks for your help today. I don't think we would have finished the list on time without your assistance. So, how was the young man that we dealt with last week? Which one? The guy with the ankle fracture, who had the delay in his operation because of his diabetes. The one that everyone had thought was drunk. Mr Jones? Mm -hmm. He's a lot better. Okay. Was mobilised well on Friday and went home. Well, that's good to hear. It was a difficult case because of the additional delay. I was wanting to speak to you about, as my supervisor about him. Oh yeah? The family made a complaint and the trust had undertaken an investigation. Okay, well, patients often make complaints these days. It's, I'm sure it's nothing to worry about. I just feel bad about the whole thing, to be honest. I should and could have done better. The risk team want to talk to me about it all next week. I just feel like it's all my fault, but I don't really want to say that. I'm worried what might happen if I did. Okay, well, I, I agree. You do need to be careful about what you say. But what happened? What, why are they investigating it? It was the day I took the extra shift because of the gaps again. Mr. Jones was in the ED at the end of the day, so I thought I'd sort him out down there and get most of his bits done. He clearly needed admitting for surgery, so I arranged a bed on the acute ward. He was a diabetic, so I asked somebody to take his blood sugars. Nobody got back to me, so I assumed all was in hand and everything was fine. I went back to the ward to speak to sister about him coming up. I had another patient to review, so I never finished his prescription. We never had our normal handover. Adam was on nights and he was late again, and I really needed to get off. So I handed in my bleep at the ward and handed over over the phone on my way home. Okay, well, you sound like you were helping everyone out, so it's difficult when colleagues let you down or turn up late, and you did everything right from what you said. You ask someone to do something, you expect them to do it and take responsibility for it. If they don't come back to you, how are you supposed to know? You're not telepathic. I'm just annoyed that nobody took his BM. He wasn't on the acute ward the next day either because of vomiting. He was on ward two in a cubicle. I went to see him and he was unwell and drowsy. The nurses mentioned the police were coming back as they were worried that he was under the influence at the time of the crash, possibly drugs. I don't think anybody was concerned that he was drowsy until I came up. Oh, sorry, hang on. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, I won't be long. Okay, thanks, bye. Sorry, carry on, what were you saying? He was a little drowsy. I didn't even think that his diabetes would have been the reason that he was drowsy in the morning. His sugars hadn't been checked. Well, you would think that a basic thing such as that would have been checked. When I saw him, I was worried he had an intracranial bleed with the accident, so I sent him down for an urgent CT. I called the critical care team. When they came, they checked his sugars and they were high. He was in a diabetic coma. Well, it sounds like getting a CT would have been an appropriate investigation. It's the responsibility of the nursing staff to look at sugars in these things and let us know if there's a problem. You shouldn't have even been on that ward either. They're always moving people around and there's never enough beds. Yes, it would have been better on our ward. I just can't help feel responsible for everything though. Don't be silly, you're a great doctor. These things just happen. As I say, there's never enough staff or beds in this place and I think there's a lot of other people that should look at themselves first rather than you. You're hard working, so don't worry about this. We'll make sure you're okay. You'll be fine. What will happen next? I've never been in a situation before. Um, well, there is likely to be an investigation, so I'd document every detail, names of who you spoke to, instructions with times and keep your own records. You know? Miss Whitaker. Yeah. Can you come and see the last case, please? Oh, yeah, of course, then. I'll speak to you later. All right. It was good to speak to Miss Whitaker. She'd been around and used to these cases. She said I'm a really great doctor. But did she mean that? She said I was assumed that he was drunk and that the operation was delayed and difficult. That's really down to me. It's all my fault. I didn't even do the basics like prescribe insulin. The family and the hospital blame me. I'm not sure what will happen next. If I hadn't have done that extra shift again, none of this would have happened.
For day-to-day -day practice, a reflective discussion around a case with a colleague or supervisor is an ideal opportunity to unpack some thoughts and reflections. It's timely, relatively safe and unthreatening. But this was not a great interaction. The trainer was distracted and there were several interruptions. This case actually highlighted some significant issues and for this type of discussion the venue was inappropriate. The supervisor was dismissive of the impact of the complaint. The doctor was clearly worried. He misunderstood what was said and took away mixed messages. There was no emphasis on learning. I'm sure you will agree, overall, the communication and reflection were poor. For more challenging conversations, it is important to optimise the conditions and the environment to have an open and reflective meeting. The greatest skill you need is to communicate effectively. As doctors, we're very experienced communicators with patients and families. We need to remember to use the same skills in the appraisal or supervision discussion. Discussions need to take place at the right time with enough time set aside and in the right place that is free from interruptions. It can be helpful to encourage preparation and reflection prior to the meeting and signpost appropriate frameworks to support this. It is important to look at all the contributing factors. Too often doctors explore personal errors and don't look at all the wider factors in system design. When a doctor reflects, particularly for the benefit of hindsight, they can be incredibly critical of themselves. We need to be mindful of the emotional impact on the second person home for those involved in incidents. They may need a follow on meeting or signpost them to support services. Be mindful of the power difference and hierarchy gradient between the supervisor or appraiser and the doctor. This may impact on the openness. You need to consider how you can develop trust and build rapport. The key to holding an effective learning conversation is active listening. We often want to talk, interrupt and offer advice or opinions. If we pause and allow the conversation to flow with open questions and actively listening, the individual is more likely to reflect in a meaningful way. We need to move away from simply listening to the words. The intonation and body language will often give real clues to the emotions, feelings and meaning. When we speak to people at work and ask if they're okay, they might reply, yes, I'm fine. Or they might reply, yes, I'm fine. Clearly very different messages using the same words. In challenging discussions, it's often easy to get a mismatch between what one person believes they've heard and what the other feels was said. At the end of the discussion, ask the individual what they've understood and what they'll take away. This is particularly important if there are cross-cultural differences where particular phrases and words may have different meanings. Now watch the second video with the same trainee and supervisor as they undertake a plan meeting to reflect on Mr Jones's case. Compare and contrast the difference between the first and second meeting. Consider who does most of the talking. Hi Ben, thank you for coming to see me today. So we agreed to spend some time just going through the incident you were involved in recently. Yes, thank you. Yeah. I just feel bad about the whole thing, to be honest. I should and could have done better. I can understand why you would be concerned, but it's good to discuss incidents though as part of the education process, just to see what we can learn from this. It's how we all develop as a doctor. I've certainly learned the most from when unexpected things have happened. And these are often the lessons that shape us in our career. I know many doctors have an enormous feeling of guilt when things don't go right and can be severely critical of themselves without looking at all the different factors involved. 
So feeling that you could have done better doesn't mean that you made a mistake this time, okay? Lovely. So we agreed that you would take a bit of time to think through things before our meeting today? Yes, I've managed to think about this and I've jotted some thoughts down for my own use. Okay, good. So do you want to start by telling me what happened in your own words? It was the day I took the extra shift because of the gaps again. Mr Jones was in the ED at the end of the day, so I thought I'd sort him out down there. Lovely, thank you for sharing that. I can see there was an awful lot of things going on. So I'd like to summarise a few things in your own words, if that's okay, yeah? Okay, so Mr Jones had a fractured ankle and come to the ED when you were on call. You went down to the ED to assess him and organise his admission with a plan for surgery the next day. You recognised he was diabetic and asked for this to be checked and returned to the ward and handed over to the sister, is that right? Yes, that's right. I wanted to make sure everything was sorted in time for the handover. If there had been any delays, the patient could have potentially been waiting for ages. We have the problem of having to see patients in ED before the ward accepts them. Okay. It's really frustrating. Yeah, I did notice that you said you were frustrated at the time. Yes, we all get frustrated from time to time when it's busy and you can't do your job properly. I was really irritated at the time as I had worked extra and the patient still hadn't arrived in time for me to get my bits done before leaving. We do normally hand over, but at the minute, it's often hit and miss. It wasn't like my last job. Handovers were more structured. I assumed everything would have been checked, but it wasn't, otherwise he would have been fine. Okay, so you mentioned two bits there. Uh, one was making assumptions and the other handover. Could you develop that a little bit more for me, please? I suppose the lesson for me is not to assume that everyone will be aware of what needs to be done and that we all can improve our communication. I asked someone to check the BM and assume that that would be done. I would be monitored. Mm. I also assumed that my colleague would have checked everything overnight and picked up on any outstanding bits. I know the nurses had assumed he was sleepy because he was possibly using drugs, but this was all wrong. Okay, so what do you think you can learn from this and maybe do differently next time? I think for me, the biggest lesson is not to make assumptions. Mm. If I ask for a bedside test or an investigation, I need to ensure I have my own way of receiving feedback and checking this is done so results are acted upon appropriately. I'm not going to automatically assume that it is done anymore. If there are any outstanding tests to chase and jobs not done like prescribing his usual medication, then I need to communicate that properly. Okay, and how do you think you'll do that? Our handler was a poor at the moment. When I was working in surgical assessment unit, they were much better. Okay. We had a sheet we updated and we used the SBAR tool. Okay, do you think there are bits you could possibly take from that? Yes, definitely. Yeah. I've been talking to one of our registrars about this before. I think we could really improve the handover process and it would be a good quality improvement project. Great, okay. Was there anything else that you think you've learned from the case? The only other bit I am kicking myself about is not recognising diabetic ketoacidosis in the morning. Most of our older patients are not on insulin as they are often type 2 diabetes. I don't really understand the perioperative management of diabetic patients to be honest and I think this is something I need to go away and learn about. That's excellent. So I wonder if you could summarise what you're going to do for me now. Yes, the biggest thing is to improve communication. I need to ensure that I am very specific with what I verbally hand over and there is a process of me checking back what has been understood and be clear people understand the plan of what to do and why. I also learned not to make assumptions and I want to improve our formal handover processes in the department. I need to learn a lot more about diabetes and how to manage patients undergoing surgery. Okay, so have you considered how you're going to document this in your learning portfolio? I've already drafted a statement for the investigation. I'm going to add a few points at the end of what we discussed. Lovely, okay. Well, it's important we separate the governance systems and providing detailed statements from the reflections in appraisal. One is about trust learning, the other is about you learning. So it's important that there is a detailed factual response to any concern or review. However, this is separate to what we need to record as a summary of your reflections, okay? So the focus will be on themes, the learning, and what you will do next. We shouldn't have any patient details or specific clinical descriptions on the case. It's really not necessary and can lead to identification of the patient, even if you don't use names, etc. So if you could put the insights and future changes we have discussed into your learning portfolio and let me know once done so I can confirm in the portfolio that we have discussed the experience and agreed the learning outcomes and future actions. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah. That'd be helpful and worth doing. Oh, good. Thank you. You're more than welcome.
this was a very different interaction from the initial discussion in the theatre coffee room. The trainee was doing the majority of the talking. The supervisor used open questions and active listening, which helped develop good rapport. The environment and the time were appropriate. There was focus on areas of both personal learning and potential for a quality improvement project. What should be documented and recorded was clearly clarified. Sometimes doctors may need to record their reflections to evidence progression in their training for revalidation or participation in quality improvement work. Remember, both positive and negative experiences can generate meaningful reflections. Thinking should be structured to capture learning and future actions. Anonymized information will usually be sufficient for all purposes other than the direct care of the patient and shall be used wherever possible. Time should be made available both for self-reflection and to reflect in groups. Teams and groups improve patient care when they're given opportunities to explore and reflect on their work together. Group reflection is a chance for open and honest discussion when things go wrong. Sometimes reflections must be written down and included in a learning portfolio or appraisal evidence. It's important to remember that reflective notes are not subject to legal privilege. Disclosure of these documents might be requested by a court if they are considered relevant. Factual details about a situation should be recorded elsewhere in clinical statements and not in reflective templates. These are two different processes. Reflection should not substitute or override other processes that are necessary to record, escalate, or discuss significant events and serious incidents. Where a disclosure request is received, the owner of the reflective note should seek advice from their employer, legal advisor, medical defense organization, or professional association. Where there are concerns or questions about the content of a reflection, the advice of the supervisor or appraiser should be sought as to whether the information is appropriate. The GMC does not ask a doctor to provide their reflective notes in order to investigate a concern about them. The focus in a fitness to practice investigation is on facts and evidence relating to a serious allegation. The doctor can choose to offer reflective notes as evidence of insight into their practice. What have you learned today and what will you do going forward? Maybe consider one key area of learning and one change in practice and record this in your own CPD portfolio.